Well, welcome. We're glad that you have been with us already today. We're going to continue. Uh, in fact, today we're going to continue a series. So uh, we're going to spend some time uh, looking at uh, the Word of God today and a specific practice. Uh, y- our rhythm here at the church is that we'll spend some time studying books, and uh, we'll, so we'll go through some book studies. We just finished a series studying the book of Ephesians. Uh, and then from time to time, we also uh, do a little bit more of a topical discussion uh, around uh, a theme. And so we've been in a theme for the last couple of weeks, a series that we're calling Rule Your Life. We are spending the next several weeks talking about spiritual disciplines or practices that we want to encourage you and join with you as a church family to include in your personal life and your relationship with God. Uh, The framework for those spiritual disciplines is something called a rule of life. This is an ancient idea uh, for the people of God that a rule of life is not rules for your life, but it's a framework or rhythms for your life. And so a rule of life is is like a trellis that you can attach spiritual disciplines on, like you attach vines onto a trellis in your yard, and then your life or your spiritual life grows up on that framework or that rule of life. And so we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. Pastor Mark talked to, to us about meditation last week. And today we are talking about prayer. So What is prayer? Let's start with that, and then we're going to look at prayer a little bit today. Uh, So the dictionary defines prayer as a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. Now, uh, prayer in its most simple form is often if I just said, hey, tell your neighbor what prayer is, I would imagine that most of us would have said something like talking to God. Like in its most foundational definition, we would say prayer is the moments when I'm talking to God. But I I think maybe then we would try to come up with some other words because something inside of our hearts and minds might say, but I feel like it's something more than that, right? Uh, So we have this idea that prayer is both simple and wildly dynamic. And so, in in fact, as we think about what prayer is, uh, there was uh, an author who wrote a book called Armchair Mystic. His name is Mark Thibodeau, and he actually wrote about four stages of prayer. This might be helpful for you as you're thinking through, well, what else would I have said about what prayer is if I were to say something like that to my neighbor? And so, Mark Thibodeau, he says that prayer can be looked at in the first stage as talking at God. He describes this as the lovely childlike prayers that are filled with lists of thank yous, straightforward asks, and memorized graces and going to bed prayers. My, uh, my mom used to call these our parrot prayers, right? Uh, these are the prayers that your kids say every time they go to bed or at the dinner table, and it always starts with the same phrase, like our kids talking at God prayers would sound something, they would begin something like, Dear Lord Jesus right? Uh, Something like that. And then you would say the exact same kind of recited prayers. Nobody wrote that prayer down. It's just the way that your kids just decided, I'm going to pray this exact prayer every single time that I pray. That's the talking at at God prayer. Uh, Thibodeau then goes on to say that we then talk to God, where we find our words and, and learn a monologue. And to intercede from our hearts about our desires and our needs. This is the kind of prayer we've been doing today. Uh, In in circles like ours, we might call that spontaneous prayer, where I'm not just saying the same simple words over and over again, but I'm, I'm pouring my heart out to God as I'm also asking God to pour his spirit out on me, right? It's, there's, it feels a little bit more robust. Pentecostals love some talking to God prayer. Uh, He goes on to say the third stage of prayer would be something like listening to God. We're going to talk about this one a little bit more today, but he would say that this is the understanding that prayer is a dialogue that requires listening to God's thoughts and not just my own. And then being with God is the basis of contemplative prayer, which rests in God's presence without concern for what prayer activity is going on. So just being with God itself is a function of prayer. 
But I think that we know, though, that types one and two, the talking to and talking at God, are probably the representations of prayer that feel the most familiar to us. They're probably the kinds of prayer that most of us engage in, and probably the kinds of prayer that most of the world thinks about when we ask people outside of the church, what is prayer? And I think that's what elicits this common mockery of prayer, which says, oh, thoughts and prayers don't really do anything, because the idea is prayer is just you talk talking to the void of nothingness that you call God, right? Now, we know as Christians and people of prayer, people who have relationship with God, that prayer is not actually a waste of time. In fact, the author and theologian Dallas Willard uh, went in on this idea in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. He said, how misguided are those who regard prayer as irrelevant to social conditions, No doubt many things called prayer are quite useless in every respect, but nothing is more relevant to social conditions than the transformation of persons that comes from prayer at its best in the life of the disciple of Christ. If you pay attention to the subtlety of what Willard is saying there, he's saying that prayer changes the world around you and the world within the person praying. It does something to us as much as it does something through us. A prayer is powerful. Amen? Amen. Just like James says in chapter 5 of his, of his book, James 5.16 specifically, he writes that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Or in one translation, it just simply says that kind of prayer gets a lot done. So the problem with prayer is not that it does not work, but that we often fail to work at it. And so today we want to talk a little bit about prayer. In fact, if we unpack this idea a little bit further, it's interesting that the world says that prayer doesn't work and, uh, and, and how many people say that they don't pray. Tyler Statton in his book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, which I highly recommend if you have questions about how to pray, he says, any way you measure it, prayer is bigger than the church. And it's not close. Everybody prays. Everybody always has and there's no end in sight. He goes on to explain the the basic argument he's making is that prayer is not even simply a Christian activity, that everyone is praying. The question isn't, are you praying, but to whom do you pray, right? We understand that some people pray to other gods, Uh, in many cases actually believing they're praying to a deity or to a god, and and in reality probably engaging with uh, with demonic spirits or or, or praying to, maybe in some other cases, praying to themselves. I have friends, and, and maybe you have friends and family members like I do, who we would say are humanists, and the highest power in their life is actually themselves. And so when they pray, they're actually just, uh, what they're doing is it's a function of stirring up their own willpower and strength to try to get something done. And we know that that is going to fall wildly short. It's going to fall as short as their own power, which is probably not much. So, everyone prays. Everyone Look at your neighbor and tell him, just because sometimes we talk about prayer at church and you go, oh, I don't pray, I feel like a terrible Christian right now, and then the pastor's going to give me a few points about prayer, and I'm going to feel like an even worse Christian because I don't do the things that he said that we should do. Just look at your neighbor real quick and say, it's okay, you pray. Just encourage your neighbor first. Tell your neighbor that you pray. Oh, God, whoo. All right, good, okay. Now take a deep breath and let's move on. Okay, there's a lot that I could say about prayer. The reality is there are books and books and books written about prayer. I've already recommended one to you. I highly recommend that you read Tyler Stanton's book on prayer. Uh, We can talk about it after church. It's very, very good. Um, But but I just don't have time. I, I don't have time to read a whole book to you or to go into a whole series with you just in this one moment today. So since this is a series on multiple spiritual disciplines, we're gonna narrow our focus on some kinds of prayer. Now, I I could talk to you about spontaneous prayer, but I think you've kind of experienced and seen it demonstrated today. Come back next Sunday, we'll probably do more of that. Uh, That is a a rhythm of the way that we pray at Life Church. So I thought it would be good if we 
focus on three practices of prayer that are modeled both by Jesus and that have been modeled by the church for generations. And some of these practices of prayer don't typically find themselves present in churches like our Foursquare Pentecostal Church or in charismatic environments. And so we want to make sure that we are rooting ourselves into the wisdom that has been around for longer than the 100 years that uh, our denomination has been around. So let's talk about some old school practices of prayer today. Sound good? The first practice of prayer that I want to talk to you about today is something called listening prayer. Now, the missionary to the Philippines, Frank Laubach, wrote, The trouble with nearly everybody who prays is that he says amen and runs away before God has a chance to reply. (laughs) Listening to God is far more important than giving him our ideas. Listening prayer is the answer to the trouble that we don't hang out long enough for God to answer. Right? Right? Uh, have you ever heard of somebody maybe use this expression? We, I, I don't know where this expression went or came from, but it used to kind of hang around the church when I was growing up in church, and people would call certain kind of prayers their grocery list prayers, right? Like when I was, when I was first on staff at the church, I was, I was 17 years old, and there was this one lady who came to the church every single week, and she grabbed the info card, and on the back of the info card every single week, she turned in, I kid you not, hand wrote the exact same prayer every single week. It was a good prayer. We prayed that prayer with her every single week, but I, but I, I, just got, I actually memorized the prayer. And I just knew as soon as I saw that pencil written on the back of that info card, I knew, hey, we're praying, we're praying that prayer again. That's awesome. And, and we, just, we just knew every single week. And we kind of, at some points, jokingly referred to it, oh, we got that grocery list prayer again, because it was the same thing every single week. Now, what's interesting is that that's actually wildly beautiful if you really think about what she was doing, but how many times do we actually just throw the same prayer up to God and then don't come back to it? Or we throw the same prayer up to God and and we don't wait to hear if there's anything he wants us to do about the prayer. See, listening prayer offers the opportunity for God to respond to our prayers, whether we've prayed them for one moment or for years of our lives. Rather than just telling God what we want, listening prayer offers us an opportunity to hear what God would say in response. Again, Thibodeau calls this a dialogue that requires listening to God's thoughts and not just my own. Or Soren Kierkegaard went so far as to say that a man prayed, and at first he thought prayer was talking, but he, came, he became more and more quiet until in the end he realized that prayer is listening. So listening prayer is what the the prophet Samuel did when he was just a boy. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, you see Samuel, the young version of Samuel, um, he's woken up in the middle of the night. It says, the Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel, who had been given instruction by his mentor, said, speak, for your servant is listening. Notice that the mentor didn't say, all right, Samuel, when the next time you hear God call your name, just begin to rattle off everything that you hope that he does for you, right? Or begin to name all of your enemies and say, all right, God, I've said their names before you, if you could just take care of that. And then go back to sleep because that's really all God wants to hear from you. No, he said, you just say this one thing, you're listening. What do I do next? Just shut up. My wife wants me to clarify that I said shut up, not God. (laughs) Moving into the New Testament, uh, there is a moment when Jesus is on the scene, and in Luke chapter 10, we see that he's come into his friend's home. He's actually traveling. He enters into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. 
And the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken from her. Mary actually models listening prayer for us in this moment beautifully, sitting still, putting off work for a time, and paying attention to only what God has to say. Now, you can't build a life on sitting still and putting off work forever, but there are moments when listening prayer is the order of the day, and Mary knew right now is not for making sandwiches. It is for sitting at the feet of Jesus and just listening. Martha was busy working for Jesus, but Mary stopped to listen to Jesus. So therefore, listening prayer can be practiced when we listen to scripture readings. After all, John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that, uh, John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is the word of God. So listen to Jesus speak. We practice listening prayer when we prayerfully listen to worship music or to guided prayer. For example, we recommend around here an app called Lectio 365, which is a daily in the morning and in the evening, a scripture reading and guided prayer. Or another app called Pray As You Go, which is often incorporating worship music and scripture reading into a daily opportunity for you to just stop and listen. Listening prayer is done when you sit quietly, maybe with no music and no scripture reading, and just listen to what the Holy Spirit of God might speak to you. Which again, he does by reminding us of scripture or by speaking directly and prophetically by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this comes in expressions of love or peace or by giving prophetic words or visions to his people. So we begin to see that listening prayer might actually be at the core and foundation of our ability to hear from God in any way. Could you imagine going to school, never listening to an, a, a single lecture, and expecting to receive a degree? I went through most of high school and wondered why my grades were so bad. I never listened to what the teacher said. Listening prayer is the function of stopping to listen to what the teacher has to say. Now again, listening prayer is not the only type of prayer that we should practice. But I put this one at the top of our list for today because I think it may be foundational to our beginning to practice genuine, regular modes of prayer. Okay, so let, let's talk about how we do it. Let's just make it practical. There's a couple of verses there, but let's, let's skip on to, the, there's a list here that I can give you. Listening prayer looks like this. How do you do it? I think you practice listening prayer when you find a distraction-free space. Okay, in 2023, I actually have to tell you that listening prayer happens best when your phone is not in the same room as you, okay? So put your computer away. No work is happening right now. Uh, your, your phone is in the other room. Maybe you set a timer in the other room so you can come and sit down and just listen, right? So a distraction-free space. Set your focus on God, being a, a, a aware, that should say aware of his presence, uh, prepare your heart and mind to listen for anything God might say to you as you pray. You might, again, listen to music or to scripture reading or even guided prayer. Uh, you can be prepared with a pen or, and a piece of paper. I highly recommend not the notes app on your phone. A pen and a piece of paper. I take, I've taken to the habit of just carrying a journal with me at all times, and I almost always have a pen in my pocket so that if God says something to me, that I can just scribble that down. Also, a great function of listening prayer is that when your actual grocery list comes into your mind and you go, oh, I need to, I need to make sure I get milk, just write that down too so it can leave your mind and you can focus back on God right? It is actually not a sin for you to have random thoughts pop into your mind. Uh, in, in fact, in many liturgical circles, uh, you find priests and monks who will remind us that you might feel convicted every time that your mind wanders from God in prayer. But many of our spiritual leaders and, and, and wise people would say to us that your mind wandering is not a sin. It's an opportunity for you to have your heart and your mind brought back to God. 
And there's a whole number of different things that uh, I could say about that. But I was at a men's retreat in Utah this week with Don and Jose and Mike and, and John. They can tell you all about that. They were there. So just go ask those guys because um, they're well-versed in the conversation about recentering your focus on God. Um, you're welcome, fellas. <coughs> All right, last thing about how you can practice listening prayer uh, is that then just record what needs to be recorded. Again, record what needs to be recorded in your journal, not with your phone. And then when the moment is done, if you really need that in your phone, just grab the recording app or the notes app, and you can record when you're done, but give all of that time and attention to God. Why do you wait to pick up your phone until you're done? Because Instagram. Because whatever app you have that distracts you, just leave it in the other room, okay? So listening prayers, focused time. Now, uh, Jesus made it a rule for his entire life to practice listening prayer. In fact, you regularly read that he wakes up, made a habit of getting out of his normal rhythm uh, or getting out of his, his normal time with the boys and going off by himself and uh, listening to God. And he did this so much that even when his life became chaotic, he was able to hang on to his connection to the Father. And I, I think this is why this becomes a gift for us as well. Wouldn't it be so wonderful if the next time your life got chaotic that you've been practicing listening to God's voice in the peaceful times, that you still know how to hear him in the chaos times? So listening prayer becomes a gift to help us do exactly that. So a second kind of prayer that I would like us to look at today is uh, connected to a word that might be unfamiliar with you, uh, but we have begun using this word regularly here at Life Church, and that would be liturgical. So I want to talk to you about liturgical prayer. Now, again, I know that the word liturgical or liturgy might not be used in the circles that you grew up in, uh, but but here we're, we're, we're just bringing that word right in to 2023 in this charismatic church. Uh, so if you were to define liturgy, the, the Webster's Dictionary would define liturgy as a customary repertoire of ideas, phrases, or observances. It's stuff you do, like regularly. Patterns, intentional habits. Now, when we talk about liturgy, these are intentional spiritual habits that drive us closer to God. In fact, James K.A. Smith in his book, You Are What You Love, writes that liturgies are not just things we do, but things that do something to us. So liturgy is a structured spiritual practice designed to form you more into the image of God. And you might think, well, I don't have liturgy. I go to a Pentecostal church. Ha <laughs> ha! You remember when I came up here today and I interrupted at the first song instead of our normal habit, the third song? Just the fact that that was weird and uh, like a, a surprise. Oh, we're not doing the prayer after the third song. Points to the fact that we have a regular liturgy here in our church. Now, does that make it bad or unspiritual that we usually pray at the end of the third song? No, that's just a rhythm. It's a rhythm, but because the Spirit of God can move and interrupt and speak whenever he wants in our church, we'll just try our very best to follow his leadership, and sometimes we miss. But today, we're just oh, going to start talking and praying and leading us into something earlier on in the service. So we took a, a, a bit of a break from our liturgy, from our regular practice, right? Right? Uh, by the way, James K.A. Smith in his book, You Are What You Love, goes on to uh, great detail to explain that you have a liturgy of everything, right? There's a liturgy and a practice of the way you do dinner with your family. There's a liturgy for the way that you purchase food every week or the way you purchase clothing. In fact, the last time you went to a mall, uh, Smith has a great por portion of his book that talks about how just going to the mall is like a practice of worship right? Like you walk up to the cash register, the altar, and you give the cashier, the priest, your tithes and offerings, and you get your blessing in return, right? Uh, now, now, Smith actually goes in on that, not to mock, but to point out how everything we do has rhythms associated to it. And if we're paying attention, even the way we shop can become a function of worship, right? 
Okay, well, but not the point of the sermon, but I just wanted you to understand, you have liturgy. Again, liturgy is a structured spiritual practice designed to form you more into the image of Christ if we are intentional about our Christian liturgical practices. So that said, liturgical prayer, Adele Calhoun helps to define this by saying it is a written or memorized prayer that serves as a framework for individual or corporate worship and devotion. So do you want to like update because you're not sure that you like the word liturgical, doesn't roll off the tongue really very well, and you're not sure that you want to say the word liturgical? So just say written. Written prayer, that's what we're talking about right now. But for, just for uh, rooting ourselves in the larger conversation of the historical church, liturgical prayer. In fact, Adele Calhoun goes on to say that litur lit liturgy is grounded in repetition, not improvisation. So that's written prayer versus spontaneous prayer. Uh, and there's, there's uh, incredible power in having prayers that are already written for us. But charismatic and Pentecostal people, we tend to say, well, that's too legalistic or too religious. I don't know that I want to not just say whatever comes to my mind when I pray. That uh, liturgical prayer doesn't sound emotional enough or passionate enough. And again, there is a place for emotional, passionate, spontaneous prayer. But liturgical prayer is designed to help us learn to resist having our prayers be led by our passions. And so it's wise for us at times to pray prayers that were already designed for us. Uh, great examples of short liturgical prayers are prayers that the church for generations have been referring to as the Jesus prayer. You can find these in Luke chapter 18. They're very short. They go like this, son of David, have mercy on me. In fact, just let's practice that together. Let's practice this short liturgical prayer. So it goes, Son of David, have mercy on me. Okay, so you ready to pray? Begin. Son of David, have mercy on me. Let's try that one more time. Begin. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, you could practice that liturgical prayer all day, every day. Right? Like the next time you're driving on the 405. And you get cut off, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> Reminding yourself that, but for the grace of God, there you also cut people off. Right? Son of David, have mercy on me. I, I, love, I love the idea that you can have such a short prayer that is so powerful. Um, at another time, we might also talk about the practice of breath prayer, which would be to breathe in with half a prayer and breathe out with the other half of a prayer. The Jesus prayer is a great example of exactly that. Again, for sake of time, we're not going to spend too much time on that, uh, but you can begin to imagine how powerful it might be just to pray around your very breathing. So they can be short. They can be long as well. Uh, I, I mentioned James K.A. Smith a little bit in the same book, You Are What You Love. He talks about how liturgical prayers often have a sense of poetry to them, uh, which makes them more memorable and allows them to somehow get into your bones and become a part of your life and your DNA or the culture of a church community. Smith actually contrasts two kinds of prayers, uh, a, a modern prayer of confession and then an ancient prayer prayer of the church. And here's actually Smith's example of what he would call a, a modern corporate prayer. And, and just so you know, this is what Smith would say is a bad example of a corporate liturgical prayer. Okay, so you'll begin to catch this. What Smith isn't saying is this is a bad thing to pray about. He's just saying this isn't a helpful way to do liturgical or corporate or written prayer. So listen to this. It's kind of clunky. He says, Today we confess that we have not done enough to protect our planet. We confess that we have failed to insist that our government sets standards based on precaution. We confess that we as consumers have allowed companies to release dangerous toxins that destroy fragile ecosystems and harm human beings, especially those among us who are most, most vulnerable. God of justice, help us understand the need and send a clear signal to our political leaders about making the crucial choice between the present path of destructive 
defensiveness or the morally responsible path of compassion and respect for life. Acknowledge our dependence upon you and our incontentedness with all creation. It's a good prayer, but do you remember any of that? God of justice. (laughs) Okay, so again, to be clear, not a bad thing to pray about but not helpful in its clunkiness for us to have this prayer get down into our bones. Smith says about this prayer example that it just doesn't have any rhythm or cadence to it that makes it sing. And for this reason, it might be a good confession, but it won't be one remembered. So then he offers, in contrast, an ancient liturgical prayer of confession for the church. And it sounds like this. Most merciful God, We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, clearly, that's more memorable. And if we were to put that on the screen and pray that every Sunday for a period of weeks together, that would sink down into your body and you would remember that prayer. You might find yourself beginning to lead your family in that prayer or gathering a small group and beginning and ending a a, a gathering with that exact prayer. Smith actually adds that part of the power of what makes us a good corporate liturgical prayer is that in church history, it is never, ever prayed without the congregation hearing this in response from the leader of the gathering as the the priest or the pastor would pray almighty god have mercy on you forgive all your sins through our lord jesus christ strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the holy spirit keep you in eternal life amen So liturgical prayers, they have a way of rooting us into a community that both confesses and receives forgiveness, not from the pastor praying, but from the God through whom the pastor, uh, or or, yeah, through through the pastor, anyway, uh, that that got jumbled in my mind. Let me start that sentence again. I should have written this down and have it be a more liturgical thought. Wow, that thought went sideways quick. Here's the point. The, the pastor blessing you in return of, of your confession, of a written confession, isn't magical, right? But it's a reminder that in the same way that you confess with these words, you will always hear this blessing of forgiveness in response. In the same way, so that you never doubt. When I come to confess like this, I always hear God forgive like that. Every single time. That's powerful. Root that into a church and you begin to normalize confession, right? You, you begin to normalize that when we pray to God, God always responds to us. Now, again, there are times when we have spontaneous prayers and God responds in, to us in ways that are surprising and unexpected. But isn't it beautiful to see that God is so consistent in his faithfulness? And liturgical prayers, as they have a way of rooting themselves in our brain, like like the lyrics to a song, are good reminders of how God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as it says in Hebrews 13.8. So the goal of praying these kinds of prayers together with the church is that you would remember them during the week as the church is sent out into the world. And by the way, evangelical churches and Pentecostal churches have rhythms like this. In fact, I was at a church for a while where the pastor would stand up and and pray this before every Sunday. He would pray, this is my Bible. So he would have everyone hold up their Bible, say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have 
what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to receive a word from God that can change my life forever. And Pastor Greg is in the second row today laughing because he was at a church for a good number of years that did that exact thing. Right, Greg? Uh, you probably recited some of that with me as I was reading it. Because you, In fact, I've seen Pastor Greg stand up to preach and go, all right, everybody, this is what we do here at church. Before we get into the word today, everybody, hold up your Bible and this is what we're going to pray. That's a liturgical prayer. And it positions everybody in the same way as the church memorizes this prayer to say, this is the most important word about my life. That's a powerful thing to pray before you get into the word. Now, the most famous liturgical prayer is a prayer called the Lord's Prayer. I'm so glad that when I paused, several of you knew the answer to that question in my silence. In Matthew chapter 6, you see that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. How many of you are annoyed that I chose the CSB translation to read that to you because you wanted to say it out loud with me in the translation that you memorized it in? Good job. This is liturgical prayer. That landed way better than I thought that it would have. Okay, so like we've taught an entire series on, on this, right? Like we've broken down the Lord's Prayer and, and we've said the thing that you need to say about the Lord's Prayer is that Jesus wasn't really saying every single time you pray, say these exact words in prayer. But he wasn't not saying that as well. It's important that we take an entire season of time to understand what does it mean when he says our Father in heaven? What does it mean when he says your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Let's do entire series and studies on the meaning of every single word of this prayer because Jesus taught his disciples to pray like this. But I think he also taught his disciples to pray this. And so we should we should come to God and pray, our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so on. Because it is good for us to pray the words that Jesus used when he taught us to pray. And isn't it powerful? I just heard Larry Spouse, a four-square pastor, say this just this week. When his disciples came and asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he gave them a 20-second teaching. How to pray. 20 seconds, just this. Pray this. Isn't that incredible? And I'm sorry that I didn't just take 20 seconds today. <laughs> I think it is important. So if you want to practice liturgical prayer, here are three things that you can do. Find a written prayer. Read it out loud. And then repeat that on the regular. Just repeat it. I remember when I was doing one of the runs through the, the Lord's Prayer as a sermon series, I had a mentor say to me, Tim, I strongly recommend that if you're breaking this down as a teaching, that you pray the Lord's Prayer every day. And so I did. Every day, I just came back to the Lord's Prayer, and I just prayed through it every single day, just as a liturgical prayer, as I was preparing my sermon for that week, for the portion of that prayer that we were going to walk through. Powerful experience. And as we practice liturgical prayer, we can be encouraged by 1 John 5.14, which says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I think we can remember that as we pray these prayers according to God's will, he hears, for you Pentecostal people, he hears even the repeated, repeating, liturgical, rhythmic, habitual daily, recited, pre-written prayers. I mean, imagine what that would feel like to 
come to God with a memorized prayer. And you say, God, this, this is sunk down into my bones. These, are, these have actually become my words. These words that belong to a church that is generations older than me. These are now my words. How much honor do you think um, the creator of the universe, the one who inspired those words generations ago, might find in your heart in that moment? So, we've talked about liturgical prayer. We've talked about listening prayer. Let's look at a third kind of prayer, um, which is considerably less structured. We'll, We'll say that. We'll call this the prayer of lament. Again, I, I want to reference Adele Alberg Calhoun, who wrote a great book called The Handbook to the Spiritual Disciplines, and she says that approaching God with the realities of sol- sorrow, frustration, and angst that consume and distract, this is how she defines the prayer of lament. So now, American Christians, actually, we tend to hide our emotions, especially from God. Right? I, I've offered this critique on multiple times from this very stage that one of the things that we do in church culture is we show up to church on Sunday and we say, hey, how are you doing today? And then we're always like blessed and highly favored. Even if what you mean to say is it's been a really terrible week. Now, it's true that in the name of Jesus you are blessed and highly favored. But what you mean is something that you feel like you're not allowed to say at church. And this is a genuine and I think a reasonable critique that can be made of American church culture. And for some reason, we feel like we need to pretend like we have it together. And then we come to God and we go, God, I just want to say thank you for all of the good stuff. And God goes, let's talk about the not good stuff too. No, God, you've set me free from all the not good stuff. I have nothing to say to you about the darkness. And God goes, that's interesting because whenever we're not talking, the darkness is what consumes your entire life and mind and thinking. Why don't you want to talk to me about that? Because I'm light and I am healing and I can actually provide hope for you. So the prayer, the prayer of lament is the practice of being honest with God in prayer. I wonder if you really think about that. Does that mean that if I'm not bringing my dark and heavy emotions to God, my grieving to God or my pain to God, does that mean that in prayer I find myself lying? It's just a question. I'm sure you're not guilty of that. But the prayer of lament is, is bringing what feels like death in me to the God that I trust gives me life. Right? See, Jesus was actually really comfortable with his emotions. He sets a really good example for us. In fact, prophetically, Isaiah 53.5 prophesies about the Messiah, who is Jesus, as being a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then John 11.35 tells us that when Jesus' friend died and the crowd lacked faith in the moment, what does it say that Jesus did in the shortest Bible verse? Jesus wept. Jesus didn't look and go, no, we don't cry. Certainly not in front of the Pharisees. He wept. In Luke 19, we see that Jesus approached the city, the holy city of Jerusalem, and here's what he says as he cries over the holy city. If you knew this day what would bring peace, But now it is hidden from your eyes. For the day will come when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground. And they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Grieving that the holy city refused to see the Messiah when he showed up. Friends, I just read a Bible verse about Jesus crying about a town. God wants to hear our lament. 
The author of Hebrews sums it up perfectly in Hebrews chapter 5. It says, During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of God's reverence. Although Jesus was the Son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. It's interesting. It's interesting that he didn't just avoid or pretend. He was honest. So Jesus seems to be very comfortable with lament. After telling his disciples that his time to die was drawing near, in John chapter 10, starting in verse 27, he says to his disciples, now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But this is why I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. So Jesus models the prayer of lament. He was fully an emotional human being, like completely human, experiencing complete human emotions. And he actually teaches us to follow that example. This is important. So where Christians are often concerned with presenting a positive or put-together appearance out of fear that we will grieve the Holy Spirit because we have not fully received his confidence-bringing work. Lament is the work of grieving with the Holy Spirit. Because, he, because we come to know that he is our creator, the giver of our life, and it's only in him that we can walk through our grief because we know that he is the comforter. So let's look at this just a little bit longer. See, Jesus' willingness to pray the prayer of lament actually positioned him perfectly in this journey to the cross. In Luke chapter 22, after the Passover meal, it says that he went out on his way as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he told them, let's pray. Pray that you don't fall into temptation. Then Jesus withdrew, withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, we could, we could dull this moment by just a quick reading. Or we could understand what is happening in this moment. That Jesus, fully human, somehow does not want to die. Father, if you are willing... Take this cup from me. And in my Bible, there's a dash before Jesus says the next thing. And I have no idea how long that lasted. But after that moment of honesty, aren't you so glad that Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And I'm also thankful that Luke continued the story because it says in verse 43 that then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Why would he have needed to be strengthened if he was just always okay? Being in anguish, strengthened, yet being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, you can make a decision there about whether or not that was like some kind of scientific actual moment where he was so stressed that he began to bleed from his forehead, or if it was just a metaphor. Poetic, and it's the picture of the anxiety that Jesus was wrestling with in the moment. I, I happen to take that moment quite literally. I, I don't know that there was anyone who, have ever, who would have ever experienced as much anguish and stress because what we understand is that Jesus was not dying for his sin. We know that he had none. In fact, Jesus was not dying to clear the ledger alone because 
Scripture actually describes that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might be called righteous. Jesus, in his holy perfection of having never sinned in the garden, becomes this anguished, this stressed, and in the most human moment we see in all of Jesus' life, he seems to have lost his composure. And his response to that wasn't to say, God, I guess I will just obey you. His response was to say, nevertheless, your will be done, but then continue in anguish even while being comforted. This is not a simple moment to gloss over. This is a beautiful depiction of the sacrificial love of Jesus, that he knew full well what he was doing. And I, it's not lost on me as I make this illustration in comparison to the prayer of lament that you and I are not the savior of the world. And that you and I will never know what it feels like to be the one to take on and become sin so that others might become righteousness. But I find that it's helpful for me to remember that when the most anxiety riddled moment in all of human history led a man to honest prayer, and that I will never experience that degree of pressure, that it must be easier for me than I think that it is to bring my little things to the God who hears me. And I don't say that to in any way diminish the pain or the anxiety or the stress that you have in your life. But I somehow find it comforting that the most stressful moment I have ever experienced is not the stress of taking on the sin of all mankind. And thank God that he did that because I am not strong enough for that prayer. (laughs) And thank God that he set the tone that in the hardest moment to pray for all humankind ever, that the perfect man turned to God in prayer. And so in my brokenness, I'm reminded and inspired to depend on God, to bring him my honesty, and to pray. This is the prayer of lament, to recognize that I am weak, but to come to God who gives me hope in life. And what's powerful is that after Jesus does all of this very honest praying, he gets up, he joins the disciples, he gets arrested, he is illegally tried, he is mocked and beaten, and willingly surrenders his life and dies. All without losing his focus for another single moment. I mean, Peter hacks off a dude's ear, and Jesus is like, no more of that, Peter. It's just the picture of composure and peace after that. Why? Because he had handled his honest business with God and been comforted and said everything he needed to say and then said, God, having made this confession to you and poured out my heart in anguish and grief, I have been comforted and now I can do the work that you have set into my hands to do. This is wildly inspiring, friends. Jesus is able to hold his peace because lament enabled him to release his anguish to God. And it offers us the same gift. And so we can practice lament by following the advice of Lamentations 2.19 that says, Arise and cry out in the night, in the first watch of the night. Pour out your heart like water before the Lord's presence. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who are fainting from hunger at the head of every street. In other words, bring it to God. Pour your heart out. Cry out to God. We can practice lament by prayerfully reading one of the 60 psalms of lament, 
Just for context and, and clarity, that's 40% of the entire book of Psalms. So Psalms, the Psalms of Lament are broken into community lament Psalms. These are like, we are grieving. And then personal lament, I am grieving. And we can practice lament by honestly telling God how we feel and asking him for help. Uh, I think that you can plan these times. You can plan them. Or you can spontaneously, at any moment when you feel overwhelmed, come to God who you know hears your cry. And so today, we've looked at three different kinds of prayer, looked relatively closely at them, at listening prayer, at liturgical prayer, and prayers of lament. The thread that runs through each of these, and really through all prayer, is not perfect communication to God, but developing relationship with God through dialogue, through listening, through reading, through reciting. Tyler Statton, again, in his book on prayer, living, uh, praying like monks and living like fools, he says, prayer cannot be mastered. Prayer always means submission. To pray is to willingly put ourselves in the unguarded, exposed position. There is no climb. There is no control. There is no mastery. There is only humility and hope. To pray is to risk being naive, to risk believing, to risk playing the fool. See, prayer is a, is a function of our trust in God just as much as it builds our relationship with him. It's interesting, I pray because I trust him, but the more I pray, the more I trust him. Yeah. Right? So if, if we're going to grow in our practice, then we would be wise to pray in multiple ways. If you're going to play a sport, you don't just do one thing on the field. You learn to do all of the things. And you might be better at some of the things, but you learn how the entire thing works. So we want to be people who are comfortable with listening prayer and lamenting prayer as much as we want to be people who practice spontaneous and emotional prayer, as well as prayers that were written before any of us were even alive, or prayers that were written yesterday. So to that end, here's how we're going to invite you to practice prayer. This week, we're actually going to invite you to join us in a daily practice of prayer. So our, our rhythm of prayer this week, and we're going to post these on our social media. We're going to send these out on our email. And as is now an official tradition at Life Church, when we put something like this up on the screen, I see lots of you get your phone out and already take a picture of it. So some of you already have the weekly rhythm in your phone because you just snapped a shot of the screen. But our rhythm like uh, this week of prayer is that on Monday, we're going to invite you to begin to pray about your week of working. We know that Sunday really is the beginning of the week. We love to say that Sunday is the first day of the week, which is why we come to church to begin our week with God. But tomorrow as you go to work, we're going to invite you to pray about your work with us. Tuesday, you're going to be invited to lament, bringing your dark and heavy emotions before God. On Wednesday, we're going to pray together through the Lord's Prayer. On Thursday, we will practice listening prayer which will not be the easiest of our days of prayer. Y'all like to talk. And then on Friday, we're going to close our week of working and prepare to enter Sabbath rest. If you don't know what the phrase Sabbath rest means, by the way, we'll teach on that in a few weeks. Just keep coming. Okay, so uh, again, we're going to send this out to you in our emails. We'll post these daily on our social media so you can follow us on social media. You can go to avlife.church and find a way to subscribe to our email if you're not already there. But this is what we're going to do this week as we together pray each day this week. Now, finally, as we wrap up this service, I'm going to invite you to join me in a liturgical prayer, the most famous one, which you remember is the Lord's Prayer. So a version of that's going to be up on the screen. I just want to invite us to simply pray this aloud together. And as you read this prayer, though, I want you to pay attention 
to the words. Think deeply about the words that are on the screen, and maybe this can make a fresh pathway in your heart that you can come back to, to find your way back to God. And then when we're done, I'm going to pray a blessing over you that is another liturgical prayer that I'll explain to you in a moment, and then we will dismiss for the day. Could you, as we pray this ancient liturgical prayer taught to us by our Savior himself, if you're able, stand to your feet with me as we pray. I'm going to look this way at the screen so that we can pray these words together. And let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you stay standing, I'll pray this blessing over you today, and you will be dismissed. In Numbers chapter 6, there is a prayer that was given to the priests to pray over the people of God. And friends, I pray this blessing over you today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with you, look on you with favor and give you peace. God, we pray this blessing over this church as we turn more and more to be people of prayer that we may more and more live and look and even pray like you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.